God willing, and I'm real clear with things, and uh, I'm hoping that the tough part of these first nine verses is over with, but I do need to review a little bit, so let's start with prayer, though. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the amazing blessings that you have given us. You've provided so much. Even as we come off of celebrating the Thanksgiving holiday. Father, help us to realize and be grateful and give you thanksgiving every day. For you certainly deserve it. You have given us so much. As we go through 2 Peter 2 this morning, I ask that you would... Use me, help me to be clear, help me to be concise, Um, guide my words. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So, 2 Peter 2, we started chapter 2 last week, and uh, as a review of where we're at, as, as Peter begins, we find that he's addressing the Jewish believers who were in the dispersion. After the opening introduction, he told them, I want you to gain a full knowledge of God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. By doing this, you will get closer and closer to God. This all comes about by diligently studying the word. Through study, you develop the Christian graces until you come to a point that you have a high value upon God and upon fellow men, a real love for others. I do want you to know that I am near death as the Lord showed me. The time of my departure is here, and I want to remind you of things that you have known all along in order to make sure you keep them in mind and obey them after I am gone. You should know that we did did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made note to you the power and the presence of our Savior Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his power and his glory and his majesty. We saw his transfiguration, and even though we are eyewitnesses, there is something that is even more sure and certain than our experience, and that is the word of God. Now, no prophecy of the Old Testament scriptures came by man's will. They were not of private source or origin, but rather the writers of the Old Testament wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit of God. But there were false prophets then, And there will be false prophets who rise from among you. However, their judgment is not going to wait. That brings us up to verse 4. We went through verse 4, so I want to kind of start there just as a quick refresher. Uh, But we're really going to start chewing on things in verse 5. And we'll see how far we get. Verse 4 of chapter 2. I said... For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue the ungodly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. I'm going to stop there. That's that's really kind of closing a thought and I'd like to get through that. I said ungodly. I am Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes, but that is so absolutely opposite of what it says. 
uh, that I definitely thank you for calling me to that because I need to correct it. He knows how to rescue the godly. Verse verses one through three were coming up and talking about these false teachers who are going to rise up. Not only the ones that that did rise up, but the but the false prophets of the Old Testament but the false teachers who were going to rise up within the body of, of these believers. Okay. And the point he's making is that their judgment is not waiting for them. And then what he does in the next several verses is he starts showing, going back to very old Testament. Um, how God has executed this judgment on various groups who have chosen to to reject his ways. Okay. Verse 4. For since God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartarus. Okay, I'm going to bring my translations directly in from last week. And committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Verse 5, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Um, he was. In fact, we're going to go back to Genesis and we're going to actually look at that. <clears throat> That's Genesis 6. Um. <laughs> so we're going to actually begin we're going to take a quick look at uh Genesis 6:3 as I studied this out, I came across a, a commentary that, that applied this in a way I'd never seen before. And it, it gave me pause to really think about what was being said here. And I'm not sure that there isn't kind of a double meaning. But anyway, then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever because he is because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. I had always taken that as a statement as you look from Adam moving forward after the sin of the garden, fall of the Garden of Eden. I had always taken this. You see this, this kind of statement a few times where God is shortening the lifespan of men on earth as an average lifespan. And I had always taken it simply as that. But it's interesting that the other thing that correlates with this 120 years is it was about 120 years before the flood after this statement. Okay? And I'd never noticed that correlation before. So it gives me pause to wonder whether he was talking about the lifespan of average man, which I think he was, or whether he also was including that this generation was only going to have one lifespan left. I don't know. I think it carried on after the flood. What's that? I think it carried on after the flood. It, it certainly did. Yeah, before the flood, they lived to be 900,000 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And then from the flood on, no more. Mm -hmm. I absolutely <laughs> agree with you. Um. So I wanted to bring that up because that begins to set the the stage for for uh, the flood. We have we have uh, I'm not going to get into a debate about the Nephilim. <laughs> I'm just not going to go there right here, right here, right now. That's that's for another time. However, uh, very very godless world there are some estimates 
and I certainly haven't really been able to dig into this much, but there are some estimates that say that the world population at that time might have been relatively what we have today. Now, that would not fit with, with uh, progressive theology and some of those other things out there. But there, there are some calculations, and there are only some, that put it somewhere close to where our, our population is today. The other, and, and some of the other ones put it at probably about half of that. Like anything, it depends on whose source you look at as to what answer you get. Um, but, the, uh, but the next one I want to look at is I want to look at verse 5 and then verses 8 through 13. Verse 5, to continue to set the stage, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Let's jump over to verse 8. <clears throat> but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Sidebar to my recollection there's only a, one other person that the Bible says somebody walked with God. Enoch. Enoch. Now, obviously, we have a number of examples in Scripture of men walking with God. But to, for the Scripture to actually say this man walked with God is a pretty profound statement. Um, yeah, the the idea of walking with God was not sinless, but fixing things as we went. We see the same concept with with King David. He was certainly not sinless, but he was a man after God's own heart. And God said that. Let's not forget that this is Scripture we're talking about. Job, yes. So we have a few. This is. Yes. Well, okay. Because when he sinned, he always. This is where the the man after God's own heart came into play here. Okay. He recognized his sin, and f asked for forgiveness. He right. admitted his blame. But okay, but he Okay, so what and you you're do, sinless, you're blameless. Okay. And this is why I am making the difference, but the word blameless in in Old Testament scripture really is used in a little bit different context than what we think of today. Blameless means I can I could I could look at you and I could examine your life and I could get out the microscope and I could I could be the opposing political party and I still can't sling mud at you. And there's nobody See, like. That. See, that's where I'm I and that I'm and that's my, that is exactly my point. Because there's always something. Exactly, and I understand every everybody has, but this is why I why I'm breaking this the terms between blameless and sinless. Okay. Sinless means you got nothing. There's only one who ever lived that way, and that was Jesus Christ Himself. Okay, uh, but whether or not you choose to walk in that sinful way, that is the difference between blameless and not blameless. Blameless doesn't mean you didn't sin, you didn't make mistakes, you didn't whatever. What it means is you, as soon as you real, as soon as you recognized that what you did was sin, you confessed it to God and turned away from it and stopped doing it. Okay, that's the idea of blameless in an Old Testament scriptural concept. Okay, and let's face it, in our world today, in our world, even, even back then, anybody who wants to cast, cast stones, 
sling mud at the wall? They're going to, and they're going to see what sticks. We see that with Daniel. And they could not find anything in his walk with his administration before the king. We're not going to find anything here. The only way we're going to catch this guy is, is with his God. Why? Because even they, though they didn't believe in God, in that God, what they did understand was that the God he worshipped was a perfect holy God. So if they're going to find anything wrong with Daniel, it's going to be in his relationship with his God. Okay? And that's what they said. Anyway, moving right back around here to Noah. It was good. It was good. And that's, that's good. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, too many people want to use modern terminology and modern definitions applied to an Old Testament term that actually means something a little bit different. And then we, we get into confusion and misunderstanding about it. Uh, but Noah found favor in the, in, the, in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. That is the setup for the flood. And then if we go to verse 18 very briefly, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife, and your son, sons' wives with you. Um... I did not. I did not make a note about where Scripture does talk about him daily preaching to those who were around him. I didn't make a note of what verse that was. But what you need to understand is that in his in his righteous walk before God, and recognizing that he was building. A never before seen a boat. There has there had never been rain on the earth. I'm sure there were ponds and whatever, so maybe they had boats. That isn't my point. The concept of what he was building the ark for had never occurred. And you can bet he was made fun of. He was scoffed at. Sure. Without ever seeing a ship like that. Best one is the Bill Cosby. Yes. I love it. <laughs> What's a boat? <laughs> uh, and he, he daily ministered to these people. He preached to them. He had to. I'll make tons of ridicule. He, he absolutely did take tons of ridicule. He had to have. Okay. Not only were these... Again, every thought and intent of the heart of men, of everyone on the earth, was evil continually except for Noah and, and the seven people of his immediate family. Talk about standing alone. And I would also like to point out, when you get discouraged by witnessing... He witnessed for 120 years and never did get a convert. Never did. All right. So, the end of verse 5, God brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if, or literally since, he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gore to destruction by reducing them to ashes. And that happened in Genesis 18 and 19. And again, it makes an interesting statement. Having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. 
Now we see in the in the context to the this story, three men approached Abraham where he was camped. Um, what we do see from this is is what a what uh, presents as a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Um, the two angels went on to Sodom and Gomorrah to save Lot, while Abraham tried to bargain to save people. Okay? And there was a point at which Abraham was pushing it, and he knew he was pushing it, and, and God said, that's enough. I'll go this low, but I won't go any lower than that. I believe it was 10. Yeah. And they couldn't even find 10 people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the cities round about, by the way. If you read the actual, the actual text, it wasn't just Sodom and Gomorrah. It was all the cities around it. So we, kind of a metropolis area that was just wiped out. Okay, and he did it not just wipe out the godlessness of those places but also specifically as an example to those afterwards who would live ungodly lives thereafter That caused me to think about the Apostle Paul's writings when he said the record of the failures of the children of Israel in the, in, in, after the Exodus, or during the Exodus, if you want to call it that, and the 40 years wandering and all of that before they got to Canaan, all of that was recorded, why? as an example to those of us who would follow thereafter. God has preserved some of these things so that we can examine the failures of those who have gone before us and not repeat the mistakes because there's nothing in my nature that isn't just as bad. And there, but for the grace of God, would go the entire world and by the way, we're seeing it more and more today. Okay? It wasn't just vile sinfulness. Specifically, time and time again here in Genesis, it talks about violence. I'm not going to get into modern occurrences, but we are seeing more and more violence in our world today. It is a result of abandoning the God who gave us an instruction manual. And it isn't just a bunch of rules and regulations. It's a relationship. And as fewer and fewer people know the God of the Bible, we see sin abounding. We see violence emerging. All right, verse 7. And since he rescued Lot, oppressed by sensual conduct of unprincipled men. Uh, the word oppressed, being and continuing to be distressed or oppressed or worn down. It's a present passive participle. So it's happening to him. He is being worn down by the sensual conduct, the licentious living the unbridled living, the unbridled lust of unprincipled men. Verse 8, For what he lot, saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Um, I really do actually want to go to this because I wasn't going to, but um, I'm going to, uh, chapter 18, it's going to be verse 
Well, we we could start of. Well, let's let's actually start with verse one. We're going to skip a few verses, but now the Lord appeared to him by the lo- by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. And when he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. As I understand, it, this is generally flat country. Generally, I'm. It's. I don't know if it's dead flat, but it's not like you walk around the corner of a mountain and boop, there's a Abraham's tent. You you can look out, you can see things, and and what we see is he's sitting in in the entrance of his tent and he probably wasn't staring out into the distance all the time but you would expect him to have seen somebody approaching and that isn't what it says what it says is when he lifted up his eyes and looked behold three men were standing opposite him it's like wham they're there and when he saw them he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. He invited them in. He extended hospitality to them. I don't think he understood. He, I don't suspect that he understood right away that, that this was God. But perhaps, and certainly if they just appeared, he could have had some indication of it. Um... I'm going to skip over to, in verse 9, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, there in the tent. Verse 10 is where he certainly starts saying things that indicate who he is. I will surely return to you at this time next year, and behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Okay? This becomes the first part of the prophecy, specific part of the prophecy of Isaac being born to Sarah. He had been promised seed, but only one, I believe one other time did it, was it specifically said that it will be by Sarah. Um, verse 16, Then the men rose, from, uh, rose up from there and looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed, for I have chosen him, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Verse 20, and the Lord said, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down there and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. And now you begin to see that interaction between Abraham and the Lord. I don't think it was lost on Abraham that Lot was down there. He knew where Lot was. Okay? When they parted, because their substance was too great for the land, Abraham said, take your pick. You go where you want to go. If you want to go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you want to go to the right, I'll go to the left. You want to go forward, I'll go backward. Whatever. You pick where you want to go. And Ab- and Lot chose the plain that led him toward Sodom and Gomorrah. And looking back at the record, while it initially doesn't say anything about Sodom or Gomorrah even being there, I've often wondered whether or not he recognized at that moment that, ooh, city life. I don't know. Bible doesn't say, so that's that's Bill sitting back in the background going, huh, I wonder. All right. But verse 23, Abraham came near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And this is where that negotiation starts coming along. 
Uh, suppose there are 50. He started with 50. Now, I don't know what the population of, of Sodom and Gomorrah was. I, I have no idea. Okay. But sounds like 50 was perceptually at least a low number. I believe so too. So to find 50 righteous within quite a few thousand uh, makes sense. Okay, well, uh, what, if, what, if, what if 50 aren't there? What if, and let's, let's keep lowering the number, and he pushed it all the way down to 10. And what we see throughout this, um, this interaction Skipping forward, whoops, skipping forward to verse 32, and he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak only this once. Suppose ten are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten. And as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his place. Verse 19, and I do want to read this because this is very much directly in line with the context that's being brought up here in Second Peter. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When, saw, when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed with his face to the ground. Very common for wealthier, I don't know that I necessarily want to say leaders, although certainly there was that part, part of it, but I do not know if Lot was actually a leader in this city. However, very common for the wealthier men of the city to sit in the city gate in the evening. Part of that was that any travelers, any sojourners that came into the city, you had the wealthy men who probably had the means to support them because there weren't very many holiday inns around. Okay? It was, it was just a completely different custom of the day. And that's apparently what we have looking here. And he said in verse 2, And now, behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. They said, however, no, we'll spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. What you have here is if nobody offered their house, people would often spend their night in the square. It just wasn't an uncommon thing. But Lot knew some things about the city that aren't being stated here yet. Let's look at them. Verse 4, before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, house bleh, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. So you have, the, the it specifically says the men, and I'm going to take it very literally here. The context supports that. Surrounded the house. You got a mob around Lot's house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you and do whatever you like. Only do nothing with these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. This is a riot for demanding the opportunity for homosexual relations with people from, they didn't know who these men were. And it wasn't just about the sex because Lot offered his daughters and they turned it down. And then they started ridiculing Lot because, what, is he a judge among us?
Verse 9, they said, stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien. Already is a, he is acting like a judge. How dare he tell us what we should be doing? So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the, way, at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the door. What an amazing word picture of this. <laughs> and in spite of the fact that is these men rioted to take these men, the, these guests by force, in spite of the fact that the men pulled Lot in, closed the door, and then struck them all with blindness until they, they literally not only couldn't find the door, but wearied themselves out trying to find it. I'm sorry, if I'm trying to do something and I'm struck with blindness suddenly, I would be stopped think, do I want to go forward with this? And they didn't stop. The wickedness of the men being recorded here is, is, is incredible. Not only that, but also the, the lack of conscience. It's also hard to understand the code of the day that would protect the guest over the daughter. And I, I get that too. Okay. I get that too. But it's interesting that it was rejected. It wasn't good enough for what their lusts were. Um, verse 12, Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here? A son-in-law, your sons and your daughters, whomever you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place. That statement right there automatically means there were less than 10 people in that number. One commentary put it at eight. Don't know. I think it's lot saving grace to invite them into his house. Oh, absolutely that. Okay, so that being the setup for this, and we know the story of the Sodom and Gomorrah from there, Let's go back to our text and look at verse 7. And I want to point out a couple of things. And, he, and since he rescued righteous Lot, in all of my reading of Scripture as a younger man, thinking of Lot as a righteous man never occurred to me. It just simply did not. And yet, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> Peter here calls Lot righteous. And says he was being and continuing to be distressed or oppressed or worn down by the sensual conduct, the licentious living, the unbridled lust of unprincipled, literally lawless men. For by what Lot saw and heard, that righteous man, twice in two verses it calls him righteous, while living among them felt his righteous soul, three times, righteous soul tormented, torturing or tormenting his own righteous soul by choosing to stay there among them, by the way, is literally what it's saying day after day by their lawless deeds. This phrase, lawless deeds, is a reference to a violation of the laws of nature and conscience. We cannot look at the Old Testament law. It hadn't been given yet. That was given to Moses some f roughly 500 years later. Okay. So based upon these examples in Old Testament scripture, that by the way, remember, P 
Peter had just said, that was all inspired by God. These people didn't write it just for, just because they wanted to. Okay? And this judgment upon these false teachers is going to happen. We know that. The sentence has been declared. Now let's look at how God has executed the sentence on several groups of people. And he starts stepping through it. He steps through uh, the angels that were cast into Tartarus. We look at the ancient world and Noah's flood. We look at... Um, we, we look at Sodom and Gomorrah, that story there. And in each case with the people involved, what you see is the righteous ones being protected out and not destroyed with, with the unrighteous, with the ungodly. Okay, With that as a context of what's being said, verse 9, if this is the case... And it is, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous ones under punishment for the day of judgment. Literally, God knows how to rescue the godly ones. Noah in verse 5, Lot in verse 7. Out of or out from temptation and how to keep the righteous ones, it's plural, under punishment, literally under captivity or restraint for the day of judgment. Okay, that's what these first nine verses are talking about here. I've got time for a summary, any comments, and then we're going to close. What Peter is telling these believers is that you have an equal privileged faith with that of the apostles, but if you want to be drawn closer and closer to the Lord... You get it only through the full knowledge of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And the only way to do that is through intense mental study of the Word of God. Through that study of the Scriptures, you develop these Christian graces which grow and build upon one another until eventually you reach the pinnacle of Christian living, which is true agape, a high valuing of God and fellow man. If you reach this, you will never be unfruitful in that knowledge of Christ. You will also be guaranteed to never stumble out of the Christian walk and have a richer, a richer reward as you enter into heaven. Now, I don't want to be negligent in reminding you of these things, although it's almost time for my death, just as the Lord showed me. But I do want you to understand that what we've told you about his power and his presence were not told as cunningly devised fables, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty on the mount. However, there is something even greater than our personal testimony, and that is the scriptures themselves. Now those scriptures were not of any private origin or source because the holy men of God did not write what they wanted to write, but they wrote what they were moved along as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit of God. But there were false prophets among the people then, and there, were there will be false teachers among you. They will mislead many people away from the truth of God. Their judgment, however, is waiting for them. The sentence has already been pronounced upon people like that. God's judgment is not lingering or slumbering. Just as God judged the angels and cast them into Tartarus, as surely as he judged the sinful world in Noah's day and destroyed them with the flood, just as surely as he judged and destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he is going to judge these, and their judgment is sure. Okay. Thoughts or questions as we close this morning? No? Okay. Let's go ahead and close with prayer then. What a powerful passage. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would minister this word in spite of what we see in Scripture here, what we must always remember with the context. 
is that these false teachers, if they chose to reject their false teaching, there was always room for repentance. Just as there is always room for repentance now. Father, I ask that people would not see this as a condemning of them, but rather as a reason for them to repent and turn to you. I ask that you would bless the rest of this day as we as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name, amen.